in your word, Lord, we long to hear from you. Uh, Lord, we long to hear not for, uh, for the opinions of man, but for what you say to us, God. We know that all Scripture is breathed out by you and profitable for all of life. As Peter says, you have given us all things. Your divine power has granted to us all things for life and godliness. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we know your word is the driving force behind that. So, God, we also pray that even as we look at families this morning, Lord, your design that's embedded into creation for family, Lord, we pray that most... uh, Uh, Most ultimately, we would see the gospel at work, that we would see Jesus Christ, Lord, our need for Christ, and Lord, also your provision of your own Son for us. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm learning this more and more because we've only been here eight or nine months, but if you drive long enough in South Texas, what are you always going to see? (laughs) <laughs> at night yeah most likely or early in the morning yeah hopefully they don't try to cross the road <laughs> i know it's, i say a prayer when i see deer <laughs> but in south texas you see a lot of cows right a lot of cows a lot of fences <laughs> a lot of big trucks right a lot of thick brush a lot of caliche caliche county roads a lot of oak trees, a lot of mesquite, a lot of hackberry, right? And so if you, if you took any one of those out and you stopped seeing them, you'd think something was weird, right? You might be living in the matrix. <laughs> those things are features of South Texas. They're, they're always in your view, right? You, you really can't get away from them. And I really want to remind us of something this morning as we look at Ephesians 6, uh, uh, 6 verse 4. When we look at God's design for families, we cannot get away from something so essential. There should always be something in our view. Anytime you read or think about the Bible, but especially today in Ephesians 6, 4, um, and it's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. We can't read and analyze and dissect Ephesians 6, 4 and not talk about Jesus Christ. If we have not done that, then we have wasted our time this morning. Amen? And likewise, I hope I'm here for a long time. But if, if guest preacher or normal preacher, if anybody gets up here and they're just talking about behavior and good moral lessons and this is what we've got to do and not do, and uh, Jesus Christ is not the main focus, then they need to hear about that. Amen? Amen. So Ephesians 6, 4, we'll get to how it relates to the gospel, but what is the gospel? Well, as you read your Bible, it is the story of the Bible, okay? The story of the Bible is not about men, it's about God. God is the hero of the story with every story that you find in the Bible. And every genre, every type of, a different type of, of writing that you read in the Bible, right? They're not all the same, you know that. Jesus Christ is the hero, and the gospel is the subject. Right? It's what it ultimately points to. But what is the gospel? Well, the shortest answer, as we've already learned in the book of Ephesians, is that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. That is the story of the world. That is the story of all mankind. Man is dead in his sin. He doesn't just need some help. He doesn't just need some good moral lessons from Jesus. He is dead in his sins and trespasses. like a spiritually dead corpse. And in the same passage in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, everybody, naturally, is God's enemy. (laughs) Children of wrath. But verse 4 says, that is true of you. That is true of the whole world until God makes you alive. Right? Peter says, God has made us born again. Right? God sought us out to change us and to love us, right? That is the gospel. Salvation is all of God. God started it. God keeps it going. And God will finish it one day. Amen? Right? If any part of that is dependent on you, that's bad news, right? 
That's bad news. It's dependent on God. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 8, he says, By grace you have been saved through faith. Yes, faith is part of it, right? You can't come to Christ unless you have faith in Him and repent of your sins, right? We don't hear very much of that nowadays in churches, that you have to repent. And that's not about you. That's about the work that God's already doing in you. But you must repent, right? You must believe. But Paul says it's by grace that you have been saved. Every bit of God's interaction with you is based on something you don't deserve. The moment you think you deserve something from God is the moment you've stepped away from the gospel. The moment you've stepped away from who Jesus Christ actually is and you've put an idol in his place. Ephesians 2.8 says, By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Is he talking about faith? Is he talking about salvation? A, a certain part of salvation? But yes, all of it. All of it. Right? It's not of your own doing. Right? Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. At the end of the day, when you stand before God, you have no boast except for Jesus Christ. You have nothing to do except to look to Him be thankful. That's the gospel. And I pray that if that's all you leave with today, then, then you have enough, right? That's the gospel. Verse 10 says, well, there's something that follows from that. There's something essential that follows from that. It says, if this is something God has done in you, then verse 10 says, we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece right and that's not you know oh look at us that's look at god's power to turn his enemy to his friend right his enemy to his son or daughter we are his workmanship created in christ jesus what to just sit there and enjoy the benefits of benefits of salvation no created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that's the context. That, more importantly, is the gospel. It puts all the glory onto God where it belongs. And man, if you've been saved, you simply receive God's gift, right? Last, uh, or not last week, uh, three weeks ago, <laughs> before Easter, we were in verses 1 through 3. And again, let me remind you, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. And so we talked about how if you're under your parents' roof and under your parents' authority, and you're a child in that sense, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, then from God's word, you can say, okay, a major part of the good works that God has prepared for me as a believer in Jesus Christ is to honor and obey my parents, right? I'm not to follow the counsel and the example of the world which says, well, my parents are just killjoys, right? And I'm going to be more like my friends. No, that's something you have to put to death as a believer and put on an obedience to Christ in this way. But Paul, again, Paul wants us to view this as connected with the gospel every time, like we started. If Jesus is Lord and has taken your sins away, and he lives in you, and he guides you every day, then here is one of the things that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. Children, it's to honor and obey the parents that God has given you. So in the Lord, it says, right, obey them in the Lord. In the Lord means ultimately you're looking to the Lord as the creator, not to your parents ultimately, right? They don't have the ultimate authority. God does, right? So if your parents ask you to sin, the answer is, Mom and Dad, I love you, but I can't. I have to honor the Lord at the end of the day, right? So children, we talked about this. You're called to do this even when you don't think your parents deserve it right? 
when your parents aren't deserving of it in your eyes, you are called to do it to honor the Lord. Just like a wife is called to submit to her husband when she feels her husband doesn't deserve it, right? And just like we talked about, a husband is called to love and lead his wife even when he feels like she doesn't deserve it. Because again, this goes back to the Lord and his love. Does he love us just when we deserve it? <laughs> right? It's laughable, right? It's the total opposite picture, right? So kids, we talked about your obedience to your parents is not dependent on who your parents are ultimately and how much they deserve it or not. Your obedience should be motivated by God's love for you. God's love for you and Him being your perfect Father. Paul quotes the fifth commandment in verses 2 and 3, uh, basically saying, this is not a new thing, right? This is not a new thing. This is the fifth commandment that God gave to Moses to give to the Israelite people. This is not a new thing. And he says, this commandment has a promise attached to it. So children, pay attention if you do this as honoring to the Lord because he's loved you. Doing this out of reverence for Jesus, ultimately then your life will be better for it. Your life will go better on the whole if you do this, <laughs> right? And this is not just do this so you have a better outcome to your life. This is always connected to the gospel, right? We can't get away from that. It's always in view. But he's saying with that promise, there will be much more flourishing and grace and good in your life if you do this than if you are a rebellious son or daughter right? But what if your parents don't know God? What if your parents don't honor Him? Is, is, is it very hard to do? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But here's where we also need to connect it to the gospel. What we look to ultimately in our relationships is God Himself, right? God Himself is the only one who can satisfy us and give us the love that we so desperately need, right? And the acceptance and the identity and the comfort and peace and joy that we ultimately need comes from God, not from another person. People are important. Relationships are so important, right? That is how God has structured the world. But even as important as they are, hopefully you know this, but another person cannot give you lasting joy or peace or comfort. Or forgiveness of sins, right? <laughs> only God can. So only God has a perfect love unlike any earthly father or mother. So children, if your parents don't know God or don't acknowledge Him, you have to ultimately look to God, just like the rest of us, for those things. So that brings us up to verse 4. Paul says, Fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So I want you to think about if somebody gave you a small pile of Legos, and then they asked you, okay, I want you to create the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Would you feel very equipped to do that? <laughs> No, it wouldn't go very well, right? You don't have any instructions. You probably don't have a picture to go off of. You probably don't even have close the amount of Legos you need to do something like that, right? And unfortunately, I think that's how many people treat marriage and family. They have very few pieces of information on how that should go. They have some examples from their parents and their grandparents or maybe the surrounding culture or what they see on TV and movies, but they're missing the big picture. They're missing the instructions and the right building materials. And all of that, when you read God's Word, you find out comes directly from God's Word. He's given you all you need. So the examples you have in your life, the traditions that you have in your life, the culture surrounding you, those can be helpful, but the meat and potatoes is in God's Word, and it's good. Amen? So, when you think about what has to have supremacy, right? Something has to have the, the, the end of the matter, right? Something has to have the final word, and it has to be this. 
Amen? It has to be this. And that goes for every area of your life, right? Marriage and, and children, right? So let me give you a main idea here for verse 4. God has given parents a very specific role and responsibility and authority. There's real authority that God has given to parents, right? We know this. Children are impressionable. And so it's the parent's job to be that authority, right? There's real power and real authority that God has set up. Parents aren't to abuse it by being harsh and uncharitable and severe. No, they're to cherish and nourish and encourage their children to see the Lord in all things, to follow the Lord, and pointing ultimately to the gospel and to Christ as their greatest need. So that's a summary of verse 4, kind of an expanded summary. <laughs> So historical context is important here in Greek and Roman households. And in that thought from uh, thinkers and writers that we have from that period, we know that the father had like ultimate authority in the home. If the father had a child with his wife, that he had the final say on whether this child had a home or not. And even into adulthood, the father had the authority, the legal authority, to kill his children. So even while they're, after they're out of the house, or above 18 years of age, even if they've got their own career, maybe they're a senator or a politician, the father still had the right of life and death over his children. So an unlimited authority, almost. But the father was also viewed as the one ultimately responsible for the education of his children. Sure, mom played a part in that, sure, uh, different teachers, and sometimes they had slaves that were teachers back in those days, but the father was the one ultimately responsible for the education of his children. But what about today? <laughs> What's common today for people, for families? What is our background, so to say? I'm sure you've noticed some things, but think about it. It's common to have fatherless households altogether, isn't it? Right? We just talked about unlimited authority. How about the lack thereof? Right? It's common to also have absentee fathers, right? Who think their job is just to put food on the table and protect their family if someone threatens them physically. But as far as raising the kids, well, that's, that's their mother's concern, right? That's the school's concern. That's the coach's concern right? My job is just to put food on the table, right? It's common to see that, right? It's common nowadays to have media and devices, right? Video games and the internet have more influence over a child than their parents. It's common. It's common for parents to relinquish control and influence and education and even spiritual formation to the state, to the schools, to the coaches, to the friends, to the pastors, to the youth pastors, and there's nothing left at the end of the day. Right? You're just someone who lives in the same house. It's common, right? So that's our background, right? We can point fingers at the, the Romans and the Greeks, <laughs> but our day and age is not much better, right? We are in great need of reformation in our families right? To simply read the Bible for what it is and honor the Lord in our families. So fa he says fathers. Why the switch to fathers instead of both parents? Aren't these instructions for both parents? The answer is yes, right? This definitely goes to both parents, mom and dad. But one thing Paul picks up on that he agrees with, that the Lord has set it up this way, that the buck has to stop somewhere, right? And we talked about this in marriage. And so this is another way that, that the Lord views the buck stopping with the husband, right? With the father in terms of the education of his children. And the discipline and discipleship of his children doesn't ultimately fall with mom. It ultimately falls with dad. They're both involved, yes, but the buck stops with dad. So he says, fathers... Fathers, and he first he says, don't provoke your children to anger. 
Uh, that, that word always makes me think of the phrase, don't poke the bear, <laughs> right? All of you have heard that, don't, uh, don't poke the bear, right? But that's actually not what's in view here. Like if you're the parent and you're teasing your child until they get, get angry, that's, that's not what's in view here. I guess that could be an application, like don't do that. You don't want to anger your child a lot. But it's much bigger and deeper than that. We have to think about the context. What's in view? What did Paul just say to children? He just said to children, God has given your parents a real authority, a real power over you that it's supposed to be for your good, right? And so the context is, that's a lot of authority and power and influence. So Paul says, in don't provoke your children to anger, it's more the picture of parents, don't abuse your authority, right? Don't wield it in a brash and, and harsh way. Your authority should be exercised in an encouraging, kind, and loving way that's based on a love for God, based on a love for truth, right? And so here's where the gospel is so important. What Paul's calling parents to do here, or namely to avoid, again, we have to look beyond do this, don't do that, right? If you walk out of here thinking, okay, I just need to be a better parent, right? You've, you've missed it, right? This goes back to the gospel. This goes back to the gospel. And let me trace it for you through the book of Ephesians, how Paul has linked this for us to the gospel. In chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So right there, Paul says all behavior, all thoughts, all words, all actions, all relationships stem back to this idea that now as, as a Christian, you are to look to God, to be an imitator of Him and walk in love as Christ did. Right? So it's, it's not an isolated command to just don't provoke your children. Children, obey your parents. Okay? It's all linked to the gospel. Okay? But then we have to go further. Who is God? Right? We're supposed to be imitators of God. Who is God? Well, He's Father. Right? When we think about God's dealings with His people, is God a harsh father? No. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. That's who God is. Look at how Jesus describes his role in John. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. And so, as we, as we study being imitators of God, this is who God is, so we imitate Him as Christians. Again, did we go, did we go back far enough? In chapter 5, verse 1, He says, therefore, right? So, the natural question, why is that word there? Why is the therefore, therefore, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's such a corny pastor joke. <laughs> so chapter 4, Paul talks about walking worthy of your calling. He talks about the truth of everything being in Jesus, which inevitably takes us all the way back to chapter 1, which says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then in verses 4 through 14, he lists a ton of spiritual blessings, right? God has adopted us, redeemed us. He, he knew us before the foundation of the world. He goes through all these spiritual blessings, right? Again, the gospel's all about God. And so hopefully, by tracing that, you're starting to see something. 
that every command that you see in Scripture, every command is important for the Christian. Absolutely. Absolutely. But every single command for the Christian is based on the reality that you were a sinner, that you were God's enemy, and you were not good enough before God to have life. But no, what did God do? The exact opposite. When you deserve that, God gave you life. God gave you forgiveness of sins, right? And took the punishment on himself so that you could go free and be free and be made a new creation in him. That's what Jesus did for you. Jesus' perfect life and merit and obedience was provided for you. In 2 Corinthians it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so then you can pick up in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore be an imitator of God, right? Because of the work of Christ on your behalf, to do what you could not, right? He's your Savior, your Lord, your Creator, your Good Shepherd. And then you can go to chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, right? Don't provoke your children. Raise them to see Jesus in all things. So in every command in the Bible, you could read it this way. This is a helpful thing. In view of the gospel, in view of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, here's what you do as a Christian. That's a great context to view every command in Scripture, right? Because it's easy for a fleshly heart to say at the end of the day, Oh, I don't need to worry about what my heart is set on. I just need to be a better parent. I just need to be a better ch uh, child, right? I just need to be a better husband or wife, right? The issue of the heart is the heart of the issue, right? What is your heart set on? That's the more difficult question. That's the more biblical question. But ultimately, that's, settling that question is going to help you the most in the long run, right? So, parents, in view of the gospel, in view of Jesus as Savior and Lord, don't provoke your children to anger. Listen to how Calvin puts it. He says, parents, on the other hand, are exhorted not to irritate their children by unreasonable severity, harshness, right? This would excite hatred, he says. Like, don't make them hate you <laughs> for being a jerk, right? Accordingly, uh, and it says, would lead them to throw off the yoke altogether. Accordingly, in writing to the Colossians, he adds, lest they be discouraged. So Colossians and Ephesians are very similar books, a lot of, of the same phrases and, and even paragraphs in those two books. And so he notes that Paul adds, lest they be discouraged in the book of Colossians. He says, kind and gracious treatment has rather a tendency to cherish reverence for their parents. Well, and what God calls your children to do, it's going to be a lot easier for them to do it if you are kind and gracious and not harsh and severe. Right? <laughs> it's only natural. And it's going to increase the cheerfulness and activity of their obedience, he says, while a harsh and unkind manner rouses them to obstinacy, to stubbornness. Right? and destroys the natural affections. So some good follow-up questions. As a parent, or as you pray for those who are parents with children living in the home, okay, or outside the home, okay, are you thinking about the gospel of Christ as you parent? Or is it simply, I need to make it through the day. I need to survive. Okay, I get it. My wife and I, we have four young kids. We've been there, <laughs> probably recently. <laughs> but God has called you to more. And again, you, like the psalm we read, you have to look up, right? You have to look at him. And so the, the goal changes from, you know, we just need to survive without killing each other to I need to remember the gospel, right? I need to remember how God has dealt with me so that I can then deal with my children in the same way. Instead of, I'm just going to do this how I see fit, or, 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 or how my parents did it, or how the culture would do it, right? I want to do this how the Lord would have me. So, parents, are you thinking about the gospel of Christ as you parent? Do you use your words, your body language, your discipline, your correction, your guidance, your education, 
or anything else you would do as a parent, your tone of voice, your punishments, inevitably that you have to give, right? Do you, use, do you do those things in a way that is harsh? In other words, are you giving your children an accurate view of God as you parent? That's a hard one, right? That's a weighty one. That puts the fear of God in me. <laughs> right? So, or do you do those things in a way that communicates love and cherishing, even in your discipline, even in your correction? You know, I love you, but you can't be doing this, right? Or I love you, but you're being influenced by these wrong voices. And it's not godly, right? It's not good for you, right? But even in your correction, and and what we would call maybe tough love, is the gospel in view, right? The second part of the phrase, he says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And if you remember back, In chapter 5 and in chapter 4, Paul does this thing. It's called put off and put on, right? If you're a Christian, you you need to put off these things and you need to put on the godly things. And that's exactly what he's doing here. Don't provoke your children to anger. Instead, raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, right? If you just focus on not being a bad parent and don't have anything good to put in its place, Well, you're going to be stuck there a while, right? So he says, bring them up. This is a present tense verb. All these verbs are present tense. So he's communicating that these are things that should be a normal part of your life, a constant part of your life, right? Not one-offs when you feel bad about what you're doing. No, like this should be a consistent thing, and that's how your prayer should go. Lord, help me to be this type of person. Change me. Right? So present tense, it says, bring them up from childhood. Rear them, bring them up, or even nourish. And it's actually the same word used in chapter 529 when Paul tells the husband, no one hates his own body, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. It's the same word. So bring them up, raise them up to what? Well, Yes, maturity. Yes, adulthood, right? That should be one of the end goals. I want them to be a fully functioning adult in society, right? I don't want them to always need me in that parent sense of they're never going to grow up, (laughs) okay? I always want to be a part of their life, but I want them to be an adult, absolutely. But it says to do this in a certain sphere, a cert, with a certain focus, with a certain goal in mind, always thinking about something. It says, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Right? So it's not merely, I want them to grow up and be a functioning member of society. And here's where we acknowledge each kid is different, right? You can't use the same words or the same tactics with each kid, right? Each kid is different. Each family is different, right? Each parent is different. Right? We're all different, and that's part of the beauty of being made in the image of God. Absolutely. But this is the framework that Paul says that you must never leave as a parent. The end goal is the, the discipline or discipleship and admonition or instruction of the Lord. So more than a mastery of science or math or language, more than being successful as an athlete and getting them to every single practice and game and all your focus is there, more than having prospects, all this, these good prospects for college, which is a good thing, trade school. Paul's saying what should drive your prayers and your efforts as a parent is this thought, that I want them to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, mind, and soul and strength. Amen? We want them to be successful. We want them to thrive in life. But even more than that, and this should be reflected in your prayers, right? And and in the formal and informal conversations you have with them, I want you to know Jesus Christ, and I want you to love him and walk with him. Amen? So that's 
That's the point of what he says. He's, and, and these two terms really here are, are the perfect pair. So the word discipline, it means providing guidance for responsible living or upbringing, training and instruction. So you take the gospel, you take God's word and you put legs on it. Okay, son or daughter, this is how we would apply this in school or with your friends or with how to think about and pray about a career or what you want to do. And so, yes, you move God's truth in to the practical for them. You help them in that way. You want them to have a good and solid and broad biblical world view, right? This is what God has said concerning X, Y, and Z, right? But instruction, the second word actually means counsel about avoiding or ceasing improper behaviors or decisions. So in other words, it's both the positive and the negative. Okay, this is what you do based on God's word, and this is what you avoid based on God's word. But again, all connected to the gospel, right? All pointing to a life that finds its identity in Jesus Christ. If you don't have that, then the others are worthless, right? It has to be rooted in something. And the only something is Jesus Christ. But let me put it another way. Thinking about parents' role and responsibility. God wants to use my life and my example as a parent. And he also wants to, me to use my responsibility, role, and authority as a parent in every way to teach my children the way of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And then flowing from that reality, this is how you wisely live in this world. And these are the things you should avoid at all costs. Right? Again, I can't emphasize this enough. This comes from the gospel. This comes from God's word, right? At the, if, if, at the end of the day, your standard for your children and the advice you give them on what, what to do and not do if that is just rooted in your own experience, your own traditions, or your own family, is, is it ultimately going to help them? No. It has to come back to the final standard of truth, right? And that truth is in Jesus, as Paul says. So at the end of the day, um, great instructions, beautiful instructions from Paul, from God, about the family, about children, about parents, and we need to follow those in light of the gospel. But I do want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, that the Bible says you are without hope in the world. That if you are still in your sins, God, if he's a good judge, you'll stand before him one day and you'll answer for your sins. But just know that God has set up a way, and that's Jesus Christ. He sent his own son into the world to pay for your sin, and to be the way for you to come to know God, even though you are what you are, God's grace has been shown to you, that you can come to him clean through Jesus Christ. What an opportunity. So I encourage you, it's more than just belief, right? Jesus came, he lived, he died a sinner's death, he was raised on the third day, and you can follow him in that, you can have life in that, but it's more than just belief, it's a trust in him. It's a forsaking of all other things, including yourself and your sin, to trust in Him and Him alone. So repent and believe in the Son and you will have salvation, right? Does it come down ultimately to a prayer that you pray or a card that you fill out or a certain way that you feel today or any other day? It's simply looking to Jesus Christ to be saved. That's what the Bible says. I also want to encourage you to pray for lost family members and friends and neighbors. We never want to lose that urgency and that desire as a church. We always want to be praying that way. But I also want to encourage you, not only pray for them, share the gospel with them. Share your testimony with them. Ask the Lord to bless that and then share with them. I also want to invite you to consider, consider becoming a member of our church if you don't, uh, if you don't call any church home, that uh, if you'd want to join with us in our journey to follow Christ and just help each other follow Christ uh, in, in a deep way, in a biblical way, uh, please, please see me if you'd like to join our church. And I also want to pr uh, encourage you, and I'll do this too, to pray for your own family and pray for the families in our church. 
that they would rest in Christ and then pursue his design for the family. Not how they think it should go or how the world always influences us, right? But how the scriptures say in pointing their kids to Christ in every way. If you need to be baptized and have never followed Christ in baptism, um, scripture says that that, that's, that should be your first act of joyful obedience to the Lord and knowing him is, is being baptized in his name, right? You're showing what God has already done in your life and in your heart, and you're also showing that you're renouncing yourself, you're renouncing your sin, renouncing the world, and you're simply clinging to Christ, and, and hey, I want to celebrate that with you. I want you to help me, and I'll help you. That's what baptism is. And any other prayer needs, uh, I'll be down at the front during this last song if you'd just like to pray um, or just let us know throughout the week. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gospel. Uh, Lord, we know that it's vain that we would try to change anything or do anything without falling completely on the gospel. Lord, it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. And so, Lord, we, we ask that you will help us in our families and in the, the families of people we know that we would know how to pray for them and how to encourage them that we would not pursue any other design except what you've given us in your word. And Lord, that we would be thoroughly convinced that it is good and beautiful and from a faithful God who loves and cares for us. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and we'll sing, I have decided. <laughs>